Christ. Amen. Today we're going to concentrate on this entire first lesson from Acts chapter 4. I'm sorry, Acts chapter 2. It's a continuation of um, lessons that we've heard from the uh, previous two weeks. Primarily, we're going to be unfolding verse uh, 42, which talks about the four things. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. These are the words of God. In the name of the dear Holy Spirit, who on Pentecost Day not only filled the apostles, but filled 3,000 people who repented of their sins, were baptized, who came to faith and began the Holy Christian Church with such energy and invigoration that it was so attractive that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved, my dear Christian friends. Within a few minutes of talking to you, do you think that people can get a sense of what you're devoted to in your life? I'll bet they can. I'll bet they can glean that right from your conversation patterns. Let me tell you a story. A couple of guys were sitting on the patio out back. It was after hours. They were kicking back, relaxing, having a couple beers. And after one of them got a little liquid encouragement, he started pouring out and unfolding to his buddy, and he said, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I work long hours every day. I come back, dinner's not made, my kids are disobedient. Every time I come home, I'm chasing after them to do something or another. They have to pick up, they have to get their homework done. It's frustrating. I don't seem to have any friends. I don't seem to have a life. I don't seem to have any kind of a me, me time. I'm so exhausted by the end of the day that all, about all I can do is lay my head down at the, on the pillow and wake up, but the next day doesn't really have anything to offer me either. And his friend waited and then turned to him and said, how long have we known each other? Since grade school, 30 years, more? Look, you know this is coming from a place of love. And we've talked about this before. In fact, you've talked about this. But the reason why you have no friends and no hope in life has nothing to do with your kids or your wife. It's you. You're not a likable guy. You're like the angriest person I've ever met in my life. You're so drippingly sarcastic that nobody wants to be your friend. You're so negative and pessimistic that that creates a pall over your whole family. You're so hypercritical of everybody and everything. I have never once heard you pay your wife a compliment, not behind her back, certainly I've never heard it in public. And all you do is rip and rag on your kids as though there's some level of perfection or standard that you expect them to achieve. You don't teach and train them anything, you just bark at them when they don't meet your, your expectations. It's no wonder why you don't have any friends. And let me tell you, I've been your friend for more than 30 years, but the only reason I'm here on the patio with you tonight is because your wife asked me to be, or I wouldn't be here either. You think people can get an idea of what you're devoted to just by your conversation patterns? You bet they can. Because there's these people who are in life and who are stuck like this guy in the illustration. And because of the way they talk, because of the way they act, they're like these people who suck all the life and the energy out of the room. But now look at these Christians in Acts chapter 2. It couldn't possibly be the exact opposite. These people are enthusiastic. They are energized. In a lot of cases, they have next to nothing in life. But the Holy Spirit had filled them from Peter's sermon on Pentecost. They had come together, 3,000 of them, on, Easter, on, on Pentecost Day. And they were so enthused just because Jesus had been raised from the dead, just because their sins were forgiven, just because they had a Messiah, that they devoted themselves to God and to Jesus Christ. You don't think that makes a difference in life? You don't think that that's transformational? It was for these people. 
It wasn't just for their souls who were destined for eternity, but it spilled over into the way they talked. It spilled over into the way they thought. Their attitudes were reshaped because of who Jesus was. Why did these Christians act the way they did? Because that's the way that Jesus acted. Jesus was selfless. Jesus was sacrificial. Jesus always treated the other guy as though their life and their needs were more important than his own. And Jesus was deeply and crucially uninterested in this world, but he was absolutely interested in the hope that we have of an eternal life in heaven. That's how he lived his life, and that's how these people lived their lives. They were devoted to those things. And because they were devoted to those things, it manifested itself not just in attitude changes and action changes and behavioral changes. My goodness, people looked at these Christians and they said, I think I want what you have. And the Lord was adding to their number daily, those who are being saved. This morning, we want to look at this a little bit more closely, especially with verse 42 as kind of the bones of our sermon, the four parts. These Christians were devoted to these four things, and so should we be. The apostles' teaching, the fellowship, breaking of bread, and to prayer. Let's take a look at these four things in turn. The first thing that these early Christians were devoted to, from which they were drawing energy and peace and freedom and satisfaction and contentment, were the apostles' teachings. Now you might ask the question, why are these people devoted to the apostles' teachings? And the simple answer is, well, because the apostles were trained by the good shepherd, Jesus Christ himself. To be devoted to the apostles' teaching means essentially that you are devoted to the teachings of Jesus Christ. He's the one who taught the, the apostles and the disciples everything that they know. In fact, there was a time, this is in John chapter 8, where Jesus sat his disciples down and he connected discipleship, Christianity, with doctrine or teaching when he said, if you hold on to my teachings, then you'll know the truth. And then the truth will set you free. Freedom! Being devoted to the Bible, being devoted to the Word of God, being devoted to the voice of the Good Shepherd, the words and teachings of Jesus Christ Himself, that's freedom, that's liberty. You know what it's not? Anger, critical, pessimism, negativity. When we know, believe, and practice as though these are the words of life themselves, the words of Jesus Christ, his teaching, the apostles' teaching, it is liberty personified. And that's what these early Christians had devoted themselves to. You know, Jesus mentioned the same thing right before he ascended into heaven. And he was leaving his disciples with their marching orders. He said, teach them, namely the New Testament church, to obey everything I've commanded you. No wonder these people, the first 3,000 people who were brought into the Holy Christian Church, were devoted as a matter of priority to the apostles' teachings. Because it's the voice and teachings of the Good Shepherd himself which bring peace and bring freedom. There's a second reason why being devoted to the apostles' teaching is important. And it's just kind of the flip side of the coin. When you know what the voice of the Good Shepherd is, it makes it easier for you to understand and identify the voice of the thieves and robbers who don't want to lead you to heaven. For example, there were thieves and robbers who lived in Jesus' day. Remember the Jews? They didn't teach that Jesus was the Son of God. The Pharisees didn't teach that Jesus was the Messiah. The Sadducees said there is no such thing as a resurrection. That's the voice of the thieves and robbers who are steering you away from the gate, Jesus Christ, who is the only way into eternal life. But the apostles' teachings, in fact, Peter had just talked about this in the last two Sundays we walked through this. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He died. God did not abandon him to the grave. He rose from the grave. And God has made this Jesus both Lord and Christ. Knowing the apostles' teachings, being connected to the voice of the Good Shepherd, helps you identify the thieves and robbers, the false teachings that lead you away from God, not toward Him. Let me give you another example. Should we pray to Mary? Should we pray to the saints? Should we expect that there's a purgatory? The apostles never taught that. How about this? Should we baptize infants, or do we believe in believer baptism? Adults only. Should we think of Holy Communion as though it merely symbolizes and represents the body and blood of Christ? 
or is it actually the body and blood of Christ? The apostles' teachings help square us off and set us straight so that we have freedom and peace in our teachings and our beliefs. In fact, Peter just got done talking three verses earlier about baptism. Baptism saves you, the Bible explains. And Peter says that when you're baptized, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, the promise is for you, and it's for your children, and for those who are far off, and for all whom the Lord our God will call. The apostles have been teaching since the days of Jesus that everybody should be baptized. Being devoted to the apostles' teachings gives peace, and it gives freedom. It also helps us to avoid those other people who are trying to lead us astray. The second thing that the apostles were devoted to, now this is in verse 42, is to, now you've got to be a little bit careful here and read the Bible carefully, to the fellowship. In this case, the word the is important. They're not just devoted to fellowship like whatever, playing softball or something, which is perfectly fun all by itself, but it's not necessarily Christian. The fellowship is very, very likely a reference to the place where God makes Christian fellowship most pronounced, which is in public worship. When these people gathered together, the Holy Spirit was there with them. That's a distinguishing kind of Christian fellowship. When Christians come together in public worship, when they meet together, God promises, uh, Jesus promises a special measure of his presence. Remember what he said in Matthew, wherever two or three come together in my name, there I am with you. While the Bible here isn't downplaying the kind of fellowship you might enjoy at Thanksgiving or family gatherings, the kind of thing that these Christians are devoted to that made them distinctly and uniquely Christian were gathering in public worship. Gathering together in public worship is still something that we should be encouraged to do, despite the fact that we've got a little bit of a virus deal that is telling us that maybe we'll wait a few more weeks and before we do that again. But the Bible says, let's not give up meeting together as some people are in the habit of doing. Instead, let's meet together and encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching, namely the last day when Jesus returns. The closer we get to the day Jesus returns, the more necessary it is that we be here. Your presence here is an encouragement to other people. Other people's presence here is an encouragement to other people. That encouragement, that holding unswervingly to the hope we have, is the whole reason why these people devoted themselves to the fellowship, namely public worship. There's a third thing that these people devoted themselves to, and it says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship. The third thing is to the breaking of bread. Now, there's a lot of folks who understand that the breaking of bread in this section is probably a euphemism or a reference to Holy Communion. And the logic, as it is, is that, well, you've got... Studying your Bible, reading your Bible, that's the apostles' teaching, right? Christians should be committed to that. Public worship, Christians should be committed to that. Well, what else do you do in church other than devote yourselves to the apostles' teaching in, in church? You also celebrate Holy Communion. Isn't that the breaking of bread? Besides that, when Jesus instituted Holy Communion, he used words that are similar, right? Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. And so sometimes people understand that these Christians here were devoted to the breaking of bread means that they were devoted to Holy Communion. That's possible. But the context probably leans far more in favor of the breaking of bread are just fellowship meals. Where Christians in a congregation get together and, for lack of a better term, have a potluck. The sorts of things that Redeemer does in Advent Wednesdays or Lenten Wednesdays. The concept that the Bible is talking about here is the things that these Christians were devoted to was each other. They supported each other. They encouraged one another. And the main way they did that is by spending time with one another, by eating with one another. As the old saying goes, man's got to eat. You probably do it several times a day. Why don't we get together with some Christian friends and do the same? In fact, a little bit later in the Bible, I'm sorry, in this very text, it says that, this is verse 46, every day 
They continued to meet together in the temple courts, which, by the way, indicates that when they were enjoying the fellowship in church, this wasn't just a once a week thing. They were in church every day. But they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. This goes far beyond just getting the kids together and the grandkids together. This is not a family, exclusively a family gathering. This is the family of believers. This is Christians supporting one another. This is Christians having each other's back. This is Christians finding out and talking with one another. How are you? How are you doing? May I pray for you? How can I support you? In fact, there's another way that these Christians in this text supported one another as well. It says, and this goes back to verse 44, all the believers were together. Again, so they're meeting together. And they had everything in common, unity. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as they had need. An additional way in which these Christians were supporting one another is basically by giving an offering. Just like Jesus, who, although he was rich in heaven, became poor so that we, through Jesus' poverty, might become rich. Receiving the forgiveness of sins and the grace of God and the promise of eternal life in heaven. Christians are not tied to material things. Maybe God has enriched you. What these people were doing is selling off all their other stuff because you can't take it with you anyway and using the proceeds and the benefits so that other people who didn't have as much as these others were able to be fed and clothed and nourished and had the basic necessities of life provided. Probably the way we would call it today is out of the excess that people had, they sold the excess they had and gave the offerings to the church so that the community might benefit. All of that from the breaking of bread, sharing food together in each other's homes, supporting one another, selling things so that they could provide for their offerings. Those are the same things that Christians today in our congregation also ought to be devoted to as well. The fourth thing that the Bible talks about is the apostles' teaching, the the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and finally prayer. Since there's kind of a context of a public gathering here, the prayers that they offered were very likely public prayers, the sorts of things that we do in church where we pray broadly, and generically for different groups and sets of people. We pray that the gospel be spread all over the world. We pray for those people in government who are making decisions. We pray for God's will to be done. We pray for the sick, and sometimes we pray for individual people by name. The Bible teaches us that we should pray publicly because prayer, by its very nature, is an act of dependency. I will not get through life without God. I won't have life without God. Christians understand that my life is not my own and your life is not your own. We all depend and rely upon God. If we want God's will to be done, if we want God's kingdom to come, then talk to him so that we might be the agents through which we can support the congregation, continue to gather together in worship, be devoted to the apostles' teaching and enriched with our freedom and peace and Bible study, Talk to God so that he might send his Holy Spirit and bless those things. But the Bible doesn't only talk about prayer being done in church. The Bible talks about praying continuously. It talks about personal prayer or private prayer or prayer inside your homes. How many times haven't you been over those verses in Matthew? Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. It's as though God is begging you, Christian. Talk to me. You're my child. You're my little lamb. I have a relationship with you. You don't need to be afraid of me. Come talk to me, and I promise that I will answer, and I will answer with something for your good. Elsewhere, the Apostle Paul, since we're followers of the Apostles and Prophets, said in the book of Philippians, don't be anxious about anything, but with prayer... And with thanksgiving, present all your requests to God. These Christians were devoted to these things. The apostles' teaching for freedom and peace. (coughs) Excuse me. They were devoted to the fellowship, to the public gatherings and public worship. They were devoted to meals together, supporting one another with their offerings. And finally, they were devoted to prayer. Now, you tell me, if you have a boss or a co-worker 
who is just a drag and sucks the life out of the room, who's hypercritical of everything that you do. If you have a husband or a wife who has to dig down deep in their pocket to find a compliment for you, if you have a neighbor who's always barking about the wrong things that are going on in your house, in your life, and what a lousy neighbor you're like, my goodness, nobody wants to be friends with those people. But do you hear what happened at the end of this text? They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad hearts and with sincere hearts. And they praised God and they enjoyed the favor of all the people. Happiness, gladness, thanksgiving, sincerity, joy, peace, freedom, all from the Christian community who was connected to God from the apostles and prophets. It was so noticeable, and their attitudes and their behavior was so spectacular, supporting one another. They're like, nobody else in all the world does this. Nobody. Nobody's devoted to the apostles and prophets except Christians. Nobody gets together in public worship in which we pray and support one another and sacrifice of ourselves to support one another, like Christians. Nobody prays on behalf of everybody else except Christians. I want to be part of that. Living a decent, chaste Christian life, being devoted to these four things, is so unbelievably light shining in the world that it's attractive to other people. It's not just placing my heart and soul with the relationship of Jesus, the gate through which I enter into, into eternal life, but he transforms my way of thinking. He transforms my speech. He transforms my behavior to be just like Jesus. Sacrificial. Selfless, treating other people better than myself. When we live the same life that Jesus did, uh, giving and forgiving, we attract other people. And then the words of the psalmist are true. Love and goodness follow me all the days of my life. And then, well, then I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. May the peace of God.